up, chat? What's going on? Good morning. We're doing a little mini lesson today. Get your pen, get your paper. It's going to be money related. A lot of people reading. Where the fuck is it? Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And those who resonate with Rob Kiyosaki, go on to read Cashflow Quadrant and Retire Young, Retire Rich. I want to talk about this little guy. By the way, if you want book recommendations, go to this particular link here. It's got all of the book recommendations that we recommend. Don't message me about it because they're all here. If you haven't read any of Rob Kiyosaki's stuff, let me just really quickly explain this. This is pretty elementary shit, but for people who are new to it, it could be interesting. This is called the cash flow quadrant. Quad meaning four, cash flow meaning cash flow. On the left of it is what the poor people do, on the right is what the rich people do. E stands for employment or being employed, e.g. going and getting a job. S stands for self-employment, e.g. building a job around you and being the worker B. B stands for business owner. This is where you get people to do the work for you. I stands for investor. This side is the wealthy people. This is passive income. This is active income. Passive income here, active income here. Now, many people have a job. They're employed and they think that the dream is to one day be self-employed. Many people who make the transition from employment to self-employment realize that now they've just got a more stressful fucking job and they probably, many people don't get paid that much more doing it. If you're here or here, try to get to here as quick as you can. If you're self-employed, get someone else on the team. Work on the business, not in the business. On this side, you're working for money. In this quadrant, other people are working for you. And in this quadrant, your money is working for you. This is the dream right here. You want to get to this side, ideally here. But to get your money working for you sounds like one of those romantic concepts. For a lot of people who don't know anything about investing or trading or speculating, it sounds difficult. And guess what? It kind of is. There's a lot to it. There's a lot to learn. If you want to be an investor, there's a lot that you've got to learn. But there's no way that it's harder than working your ass up until you're 70 years old. Could you imagine doing active income for your whole entire life from when you were 15 all the way until you're 70? Getting yourself in debt, getting a pledge till death, having kids and a family and getting locked down and trapped? I'm sure for some people that's their thing. That's what they would love to do and that's what they would, dedicate their, they would love to dedicate their life to. For me, fuck that. I would hate to do that. I would probably kill myself. So with that in mind, I want to share an investing philosophy. A couple of weeks ago, I did a four-part investing mini-series. If you missed it, it was pretty bloody good. Go here to watch it on YouTube. A couple of weeks ago, when I did that mini-series, I was specifically referring to passive investment. Passive investing portfolio, Ben Graham refers to it as the defensive investor. In comparison to taking drugs, becoming a passive investor is kind of like having a coffee in the morning. It gives you a little, gives you a little pep up in the morning. If you're a student of mine, you'll know that I also teach active speculation forex trading. Becoming a speculator, in particular an FX speculator, is at the other end of the scale. In comparison to taking drugs, becoming an FX day trader, a currency speculator, is kind of like snorting crack cocaine off a stripper's tits. Coffee versus crack. Now, what I'm going to teach you today is somewhere in the middle. It's kind of like going to the pub and getting fucked up and maybe losing your manners a little bit. What I'm going to teach you today is stock picking. One particular stock picking philosophy that you might want to look into. By the way, this won't be comprehensive. The, to do a full stock picking thing, that's a full course. I can make a full course about this. This is, going to, this is Snapchat. It's going to be very elementary. And to frame up this lesson in just another way, we have investing down here. We have speculating up there. This is buying the market. This is the last mini-series. This is Forex trading, which is right on the edge of gambling. Beyond speculation, you, you're right on the edge of gambling. This is the highest risk, but also the highest reward. Right in the middle is picking undervalued stocks. And to pick undervalued stocks, I want to introduce two main indications that you might want to familiarize yourself with. After the lesson, I recommend, if you're interested, look into them further. The first one is book value. You want to look up book value, the book value of a company. The book value is all the assets of the company minus the intangibles and minus the liabilities. Because when you buy a stock, when you invest in a company, that company has a book value. It has an intrinsic value. It has buildings. It might have cars. It might have cash. And if the business shits itself and can no longer trade and can no longer make a profit, there's still intrinsic value in the company, whether they make a profit or not. The absolute book value of a company doesn't really matter too much. It's the ratio between the book value and the price of the stock. It's called the PB ratio, price to book. Very, very easy to find it. Just go to any bloody website, Yahoo Money, CNN Money, type in a company such as this one, Apple. You can see, usually on the homepage, Growth and valuation, and here we have price to book. The bottom one, price over book, 5.96 at the moment for Apple stock. 
The magic number when you're trying to pick undervalued stocks is one, a PB of one. What that means is the price represents the book value one to one. In other words, if the price of a stock is 10 bucks a share and the book value of that company comes in at 10 bucks a share, that $10 you spend on every share goes straight into assets. Every single dollar that you invest into that company, you're buying their assets one for one. You're buying intrinsic value. You're buying their buildings, you're buying their equipment, you're buying into their cash one for one. The effectiveness of their business operation will determine how efficiently they can convert their buildings, can convert their machinery and convert their cash into profit. And if you're buying into good companies that are well managed, they will generate a profit. That profit is an extra to you. You bought part of their assets, they're doing the work, they're coming up with the profitability. When you're self-employed, you gotta go and buy a vehicle, or you gotta go and buy equipment, then you have to fucking get in the car and drive it around places and turn it into profit. You gotta make money on your equipment. But when you're an investor who finds undervalued stocks and you can find any stock with a PB ratio of one, every dollar that you spend on their share price, you're buying their vehicles. And that company has gone and employed scallywags in the top left column here, the employees to go and drive the vehicles for you, and they will generate the profit while you do fuck all. But if the company's poorly managed and they never get their shit together and they don't make any money, you're still buying the assets. So if they have to sell up and close doors and they shit themselves, you still have the assets. The second indicator I want to introduce you to is the PE ratio. It's the price to earnings ratio. Thing is, you can buy heaps of stocks with a PB less than one. I'm seeing here 1,030 stocks at the moment that you could buy with a PB less than one. I'll show you this stock screener in a little bit. But low PB could mean that the company shit. The company is useless as sits on a bullet making any degree of profit. Low PB could mean the company is shit. It probably does mean to a degree that the company is struggling. That's why. You want to combine a low PB with a low PE. Meaning, the low PB means you can buy intrinsic value and get a good margin of safety. A low PE means that for every dollar you spend on those assets, you're actually buying a company who knows how to make money, who knows how to generate income. That's important. When you put them two together, for the record, a low P.E. ratio is considered 15 or less. If you're picking undervalued stocks, you could go even lower. You could go under 10. Just, there's P.E. less than 10. So really quick, I want to show you my stock screener. I want to wind this lesson up pretty quickly now. Finviz.com, you want to check it out. There's heaps of stock screeners online. This is my favorite. Jump onto their website. Click this guy here, screener. It has on the book 7,000 odd stocks to peruse and filter. On the screen here, there's a couple of tabs and all these drop downs are filters that you can filter the bloody stock list. So dividend yield. So you can drop this down and say any stock that earns a dividend. On the fundamental tab, we have all the things that we were just talking about. PE is the very first one. So you can drop down and say, pick all the stocks with a PE under 15. Over here on the right, we've got the PB ratio. So anything under one, that literally means one, a one PB means we're literally buying assets one for one. We're not paying any market surcharge. Just below here, PB, I also put a positive EPS growth over the last five years. It literally means the company is growing in earnings over the last five years. And I got a couple of little other filters in play here, but I want to keep the lesson kind of quite simple. What I've done is I've reduced 7,000 stocks into six. Remember at the start of this lesson, I said this was not a comprehensive lesson. This is not stock picking 101. This is not financial advice. Don't necessarily go and buy these without doing your own fucking research. There are many, many indicators and indications that you might want to look up. One is under ownership, insider transactions. That means if the insiders are buying back their stock, that's a positive confluence factor. That doesn't mean that you'll win with certainty, but if the insiders are dumping all their stocks and abandoning ship, probably a good idea not to buy their stock. So we're going to assume that you have five, ten, twenty thousand dollars that you want to put into a speculative investment. We are stock picking. This counts as speculation. You want to diversify. You don't want to do one company and then Hope that it goes up. That's crazy. You want to diversify. Some of these could still go broke. Some of them could belly flop. You don't need to win them all. So assuming you've gone and done your research and you've chosen, let's just say these six stocks for the sake of this example, you want to purchase these six stocks. You do an even split. Say you want to put 12 grand into six stocks. You buy $2,000 worth of each. These are the respective dividend yields, which averages 6.2% per annum. On your six stocks, your PBs are as follows. Oh, look at that, all under one. I average these out to be 0 0.65 PB overall. Which means if you put $12,000 over six stocks with a PB of 0 0.65 on average, you're buying 18,300 worth of assets. Putting down 12 grand, you're buying 18,000 worth of assets, not including these companies' ability to generate profit, not including the dividend that you're getting each year. You're getting an income. 
The earnings per share over the last five years have gone up on each one of these stocks. It means that they're making more money each year over the last five years. So these companies are making money over the last five years. They're making money now. Their current ratio is over 1.5, which means that they have enough cash on hand to pay any upcoming debts. All of their price to earnings ratios are quite low. Their PB ratios on average allow you to buy into their assets at 65 cents on the dollar, and they'll pay you a 6% per annum dividend while you wait. This is just one of the many, many, many philosophies around stock picking and value investing. There are many, many more. This was quite an elementary one, if I'm honest. But hopefully by going through the numbers, you sort of see what it means to be an investor, to be in the investing quadrant. It doesn't require that much effort. If you enjoyed today's lesson, please let me know. I appreciate that. If you have a follow-up question for tomorrow, please let me know. I appreciate that. Have a good day. A couple of immediate follow-up questions. I said literally a lot in that lesson. I also did a typo with the dividend. Let me clarify that. To calculate the average dividend yield, you add up all the dividends and divide it by the number of shares. I had I accidentally typed five. I was meant to type six. There's six stocks, 5% dividend. And one last thing, <clears throat> ESBI. If you're, let me turn this around. If you're here, there is absolutely nothing wrong with being here. This is part of the journey. It's very rare for someone to go from being employed to full-time investor drinking cocktails on the beach. The general flow is employment to self-employment to business owner. It goes like that. There's generally a flow. There's some people who jump some steps and stuff, but that's, uh, that's more rare. Just know that if you're in here and you have a fantasy about drinking cocktails on the beach or you're going to be wealthy and not have to go to work, you're going to need to at least jump to there. And even then, if you have the fantasies about drinking cocktails on the beach all day, you probably really haven't found what you love doing. When you find a thing that you love to wake up and go and do every day, you won't have time to drink cocktails on the beach. It gets boring. I've done it many, many, many times. I took the laptop down to the beach and I sat on one of the things. I got a crook back, I got a sore back, I got drunk, I got hungover, I got dehydrated. There was glare on the screen, I got sand in the laptop. It was a fucking nightmare.